Hello class, Professor Mandeville back. Uh, this is lecture number two for History 101, Summer 2020. And before I get started with the material today, I just wanted to stress the importance of you participating in the discussions. Module two discussions been open since the 31st of May and only one student has entered it. It's a big part of your grade and you need to be in there participating almost on a daily basis, especially in a condensed summer session. So get in there and start talking about my first lecture and the questions I posed. And one question I posed for you guys was concerning the Mississippians, which most of you have probably never heard of before. And they're briefly mentioned on pages five and six in your textbook in a section on mound builders, because they indeed were mound building Native Americans. Now, I want to talk about them because really uh, the Mississippian culture that obviously was centered on the Mississippi River, it's a riverine culture, any culture that depends greatly upon a river is known as a riverine culture, uh, are, the, are Amer North America's Egyptians. They built a very impressive city by the name of Cahokia at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri River in present day East St. Louis, Illinois. Now, I, in the mini lecture, there are some links where you can go to the Cahokia website, which is an Illinois state historic site. And it, there's a lot of interactive uh uh, things on there, including a couple videos that you should watch about the Mississippians. They're an amazing culture, and I'll tell you a little bit about them, and you can watch those videos on the official Cahokia website. Their, Cahokia is the main city of this culture, and it existed between 800 and 1500 AD. At its height, around 1250, there were between 20 and 30,000 people living in this city. And to put that in perspective, the largest city in the British colonies uh, in the 1770s was Philadelphia. And it had a similar population to Cahokia. And obviously that's way into the future. Now, Cahokia was an impressive city. You can look at different uh, artist depictions of it on that website. Uh, it was a stockaded city to protect themselves against whoever their enemies were, which aren't clear. They were a farming-based society. Just like when we talked about the Iroquois last class, they, were, they depended on the Three Sisters farming and obviously you have to be an advanced farming uh, civilization to sustain a population between 20 and 30,000. You can't be hunt gatherers. Now also they obviously augmented their diets with fish out of the Mississippi River. In Cahokia, they, you know, why they're known as mound builders, they built these very impressive mounds. And the largest mound that you'll see depicted in these artist drawings is Monk's Mound, which was in the center of the city. It was built out of dirt, not stone like the Egyptian pyramids, but it's just as an impressive uh, structure. And they explain that in those videos on the website. But to give you an idea how large it was, uh, it was at its base... It was 15 acres, and it was over 100 foot high, and it was built by hand where people would dig out dirt, put it in a basket, carry it to that site, dump it out, and pack it down. It took years and years and years to build this impressive structure. And in the areas around Cahokia, where they were doing this massive digging, they formed man-made lakes, and where there is some evidence that the Mississippians also practiced fish farming in those lakes. Pretty impressive for around 1200 AD. Uh, so check that out online. A couple other things about the Mississippians. 
Uh, they were a trade-based culture also because there are artifacts found at Cahokia using materials all the way from the northern reaches of the Mississippi River up into upper Minnesota into the upper peninsula of Michigan because there's copper items found there and that's the only place they're going to get copper because copper was very prevalent in, in the north. And there are seashells that things are fashioned out of that only live in the Gulf of Mexico. So they travel all the way down the Mississippi to the uh, Gulf of Mexico and carry on trade. So they're a very impressive society. Why they disappeared around 1500 is still a mystery. May have been, uh, you know, natural disasters like flooding, destroying their crops too many years in a row, which caused famine. And then they dispersed to other areas and became smaller civilizations. It's not really clear. But once again, I encourage you to explore the Cahokia website. Watch the videos on there. It's very interesting material. Now, uh, part of the reason why we had this tremendous civilization that most of you have probably never heard of before it they, goes back to what I was talking about with uh, Native Americans in the last lecture. It's due to the Eurocentric point of view. Now, uh, I gave you an example of how Native Americans uh, would never build a permanent city in New Orleans because they know it would flood, but Europeans think they can conquer Mother Nature so they will build uh, such monstrosities as New Orleans. It also has to do with a couple other factors related to Eurocentrism or the idea that Europe is the center of the world or the universe or whatnot, which Europeans prescribe to. Uh, one thing is Native Americans did not have a written language. Uh, they only did things in the oral tradition. The first written language or the first time that uh, a Native American created characters to be able to write their own language was in the early 1800s when the Cherokee created an alphabet and started printing things in the Cherokee language. Before that, all Native American tribes would pass on their histories and so forth orally and there would be tribal historians and elders that that was their responsibility to pass on the stories of the past, which was their history. So since they didn't leave behind a written record, it allowed Europeans who had been writing for a long time to write their version of what Native Americans were all about. And obviously, as we talk about the contact periods as the Spanish, the French, the British, and the Dutch venture into our continent of North America, many of them come here to conquer and seize land. So in order to do that and justify it, they're going to downplay the existing cultures that were here already and paint them to be, quote unquote, heathen savages in many cases, where they were anything but they were very sophisticated societies that lived, for the most part, pretty peaceful lives and lived very good lives, like I explained to you with the Iroquois. So that's part of the reason why you've never heard of the Mississippians before, because they were sort of mysterious, but also any especially Spanish explorer who may have come in contact with them is going to downplay them because they want to exploit people in North America, not promote them as equals. And to give you an idea of how this, you know, is still evident in, uh, you know, our education system today, uh, most of you know a great deal about the Egyptians. And the Egyptians obviously are, you know, focused upon in K through 12 education in New York State. 
And obviously, you most I know all of you know way more about the Egyptians than you do the Mississippians, if you've ever heard of them. And that's part of that Eurocentric point of view. But one thing where we can see that applied even to the Egyptians, what a lot of people don't put two and two together and realize is, and I know it was a while for me to really figure this out until I went to college, did it dawn on me, Egyptians are Africans. Their entire civilization, which was another riverine civilization on the Nile River, is entirely in, on the continent of Africa. We don't really think about Egyptians being Africans because Europeans also uh, severely downplayed African cultures. So they don't really want to recognize Egyptians who they can ignore as being an African culture. And today historians have concluded that one Egyptian I'm sure you've studied and probably watched movies about or whatever, Cleopatra. Cleopatra was a very attractive black woman. So I can remember when I was growing up, the famous Cleopatra movie that showed in theaters starred Elizabeth Taylor, of all people. Now we know she's completely miscast, and if they made a new version of it, it should probably star somebody like Holly Berry instead. So it's another example of how you don't even really think of that until you deeply think about it. Which brings me to another subject that I want to cover today, which is in your book on page 16, it's how Europeans, before they ventured to North America uh, in massive numbers. Now, one thing I want to set straight, uh, the first European to step foot in North America was not Christopher Columbus. And obviously the first person to step foot in North America <clears throat> was an ancestor of a Native American probably sometime around 50,000 years ago or earlier. But in the year 1000, Leif Erikson and the Vikings landed in Newfoundland and Labrador and for a time period had permanent settlements there. They had sort of hopscotched across the Atlantic and they had colonized parts of Greenland. Then they went to Newfoundland and Labrador in around the year 1000. Their stay was relatively brief, a decade or so, and they uh, alienated the local Native Americans in the region, and they were repelled off the continent and sent packing back to Greenland where they came from. Now, obviously it's gonna be 500 years almost before Christopher Columbus shows up here. Now, uh, when we, but what we back to what I was originally, I steered off course there a little bit. Uh, Europeans explored the African continent before they came across the Atlantic to North America. And this happened in the 1400s. The first to venture down onto the African continent were Portuguese sailors. And very quickly, uh, you know, the trade started to exist between the Portuguese, then the Spanish and other Europeans, and the inhabitants of the African continent. The reason why the Portuguese sailors went there is the same reason Columbus uh, traveled to North America. They're looking for an ocean route to Asia because trading had already started to exist with the Chinese. But it was overland, which took a tremendous amount of time to get back and forth. So the original shortcut was around the tip of Africa. Now, this contact period with the Europeans, first the Portuguese, followed by the Spanish and others, and the inhabitants of the African continents is something that's also a mystery to most Americans. I really wasn't introduced to any African history until I went to college and took a couple courses on African history. 
I can remember leaving high school thinking, geez, Africa is a really neat continent with a lot of really large animals. I knew nothing about the people that lived there for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, we believe the origin of man came on the African continent today. So, when the Portuguese and the others first were venturing there in the 1400s, especially in Central uh, Africa, uh, there was a lot of African kingdoms. And there were these great African kings who controlled large tracts of land and had huge armies. This is the area in Central Africa on the Atlantic coast where they're landing in starting trade relationships. But one thing you need to realize is they're trading on African terms. They're not dictating policy to anyone. These great African kings and their armies could have expelled the Portuguese and the Spanish or any of them anytime they wanted to. So this trade that uh, sparked up, you can see it named on some old maps of Africa by what they were, uh, what they had a lot of and what they were trading. If you look at 1400, uh, you know, maps of Africa, you'll see places labeled the Ivory Coast, the Gold Coast, the Slave Coast. So this brings me to another point. I want to talk a little bit about slavery, original slavery on the African continent that existed there before any Europeans arrived. Because obviously, with what's going on in America today and this our quest towards final equality and the end of racism, slavery is a big issue. And in Africa, before any Europeans showed up there, there was slavery. And it's discussed uh, in your book on page, uh, page, next to that map of the African exploration on page 16. The slavery that existed among Africans, uh, typically, if you were a criminal, you were in debt, or you were captured in a war, you could be enslaved. But it was slavery with rights. You would be given land, ultimately, or you could be freed, especially uh, by the kingdom you came from. If there was a war between two kingdoms, there was no such thing as prisoners of war back then. If you were taken captive, you were enslaved. But then if your country came back and attacked that kingdom that had enslaved you, you could be liberated and brought back to your home. Also, ultimately, Slaves who were held for debt or crime would ultimately be freed. So it was temporary slavery with rights, and they some slaves even had land rights in Africa. So it was a completely different type of slavery. So the origins of slavery in North America evolve out of this. European traders in the 1400s and later in the 1500s are trading with these African kings. And what the Africans really were interested in that the Europeans had and they didn't was items made out of metal. They didn't have metal technology yet. So something as simple as an iron pot was very valuable because they were using clay pots. Clay pots break very easily, especially when they're heated up all the time over a fire. So they're trading gold, ivory, and ultimately slaves for typically items made out of metal. Now, when the uh, Europeans trade for slaves, they end up taking them to other colonies they hold, and then later on, that influx will make it into the Caribbean through the Spanish, and that's when slavery will become completely distorted. It'll become permanent, and 
white Europeans will have this attitude that they own these people forever because they bought them. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no road to freedom. And then, uh, obviously, as we get into the late 1500s and 1600s, and Europeans gain the upper hand on the African continent, the brutal process of going to Africa with the intent of capturing people like wild animals with nets, throwing them in the holes of ships, shipping them across the Atlantic, and selling them like they were trade goods evolves in North America. So, this is a very unfortunate part of our history, and we're still dealing with it today. So, it's important, though, that everybody knows the history of it and how it became distorted by these European colonists. It was a different system when it existed on its own in Africa. So, that's it for this lecture. I'll be back shortly after I take a break. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, the... European contact period, what the Spanish were all about, and uh, how they then uh, wreaked havoc with the Native American populations. So I'll sign off for now. I'll be back in a little bit after I take a break here, and we're going to talk about uh, Columbus. See you soon.